got this owl. I don't know if he'll be able to hear you, so I'll repeat your questions so that people on Zoom can hear. Um, so the way this is going to work is I'll introduce Sushila shortly. Um, then Sushila is going to read for us um, her essay that she's written on the theme of hope. And then she and I will do an in conversation for about 20 minutes to half an hour. And then we just welcome your questions. So it's quite free flowing and you'll see the sort of things that you can talk about. It's a lot to do with uh, the landscape of publishing right now and in the future, what hope there is about diversity and inclusion and other matters. And we're particularly talking about this beautiful book, um, Brave New Words, which you'll hear more about. Sushila Nasta MB is founder of Wasafiri, the magazine of international contemporary writing she launched in 1984 and led till 2019. A literary activist, writer and presenter, she has judged several literary prizes, including the 2021 David Cohen Award offered for a lifetime's work in any genre, and this year, the Saif Banipal Prize for Arab Literary Translation. She's currently Professor Emerita in Modern and Contemporary Literatures at Queen Mary University of London and the Open University. She's published several books and numerous articles since the 1980s, writing on Caribbean, South Asian and Black British writing with a focus especially on Sam Selvon, Black women's writing, as well as one of the first books in Britain on the literatures of the South Asian diaspora. She's committed to public engagement and has directed several major research projects, including most recently an open an outdoor touring exhibition, India in Britain, in collaboration with the OU, the University of Exeter and the Indian High Commission. Her publications include Asian Britain, A Photographic History, Brave New World, Words, The Power of Writing Now, and her editorship with Professor Mark Stein of the first Cambridge history of Black and Asian write, British writing from 2020, which was a history that stretched back for over 400 years. Currently completing a group biography, The Bloomsbury Indians, which we were lucky enough to have Sushila give a lecture to us about last night. She's writing a personal memoir and continues to act as literary representative for the estate of Sam Salvan. In 2019, she received the Royal Society of Literature's Distinguished Benson Medal, a mark of a lifetime achievement. In 2020, she was made an honorary fellow by the English Association for her pioneering contributions to English studies. She sits as member of council for the RSL Awards for the Contemporary Arts. And just to speak personally, I didn't get the chance to say this last night, so I want to say this um, since it's a bit more of an informal environment tonight. Sushila has been an inspiration to me, both for her research and public engagement and also her tireless work for greater inclusivity in literary studies and for early career researchers and women in academia. If I could do even half as much as she has achieved, then I would retire a very happy person. I was once in her company when an example of the significance and reach of her research's impact came through in the shape of an email to her phone from a stranger in the South Asian subcontinent who wrote to write of being moved by her work. So Sheila, in her customary way, reacted with surprise and humility, but it was unsurprising to me. So Sheila's huge AHRC funded project, Making Britain, was all about the formative contributions South Asians made to Britain and continue to make to Britain's literary, political and cultural life. But she was talking especially about the early period of 1870 uh, to the 1950s, which often gets overlooked because um, of this kind of overemphasis on a post-war um, migration that has a much longer history that Sushila has been really pioneering in um, uncovering and, and deepening our understanding of. As I wrote my book, Written Through Muslim Eyes, her work was absolutely invaluable to me. And every year I tell students that the project and it's very usable um, and useful database are a model of what research can achieve. So, we're very lucky that we've had Sushila's uh, company for two days with the wonderful lecture last night and today's talk about hope. Um, so today she's going to read to us um, her essay, A Small Act of Hope. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Thank you very much. Um, and I should just add that that database, um, which came out of the Asians in Britain project, um, some colleagues of mine who worked with me on the project um, have now taken it further and they're going to bring it up to the present and if they get the grant sort of digitize quite a lot of the archive materials so that should be quite exciting. 
um, if it happens, um, and maybe linking up with archives in India and the subcontinent. So, um, when Claire asked me to write this piece, I wasn't quite sure what to do because I didn't feel very hopeful. Um, and in the end, I decided to focus it on this anthology, which you can see there. On the, and um, it was an anthology that came out of a magazine called Wasafiri, um, the magazine of international writing. It was a separate project altogether, but it sort of celebrated 35 years of the magazine. Um, but it also was commissioned really at the point, which is hard to remember now, sort of pre the pandemic, when things were looking actually pretty bleak, um, when Trump was still um, the president of the United States, when all sorts of things were happening in terms of migrations, and there were all kinds of restrictions of, on human freedom and freedom of speech. So when we commissioned this book, we were really trying to get writers to engage with those kinds of issues and to use words as literature in action, I guess. Um, and we commissioned people from all over the world to, to write and to really take their words for a walk. So in November, 2019, on the eve of what was to become a global pandemic, Wasafiri celebrated 35 years of publishing producing a special 100th issue and an anthology of essays, Brave New Words. Playing on the prescient title of Aldous Huxley's classic 1930s dystopia, we invited 15 writers from different cultural geographies and histories to reflect on the politics of the present and imagine possible directions for the future. Foregrounding the crucial role of the creative writer today in asking questions and opening dialogues across often impassable barriers of prejudice and thought, the book's aims coincided with the vision of Wasafiri, the small publishing and activist arts organization that inspired it. Publishing a range of contemporary writing and focusing on the work of those whose literary and historical preoccupations do not necessarily sit neatly within the sometimes confining rubrics of any one particular national movement or tradition, Wasafiri's name, derived from the Kishwahili word for travelers, itself a hybrid of the Arabic safari, has always highlighted the magazine's focus on writing as cultural traveling and its mission to open cross-cultural dialogues and forge connections between apparently conflicting words, worlds. And we deliberately chose a non-English word for the title, even though we you know, were set up in the 1980s to make people stop and think and people kept saying to me what is was a theory was a theory what what is it um and that was the whole point in a way though one of the first and only magazines in britain to have offered sustained and serious critical exposure to several generations of african caribbean south asian and black british writers was theory's work has only recently gained full public recognition many early pieces published in the magazine were not on the radar of publishing houses at the time though many were authored by soon to be award-winning writers and laureates, including most recently, Bernadine Evaristo, 2019 Booker winner, Roger Robinson, 2020 T.S. Eliot Award for Poetry, Abdul Razak Gurna, 2021 winner of the Nobel, and Monique Roffey, winner of the 2021 Costa Book of the Year. And you know, I could recite a lot of others. Um, that's not really just to show off what Swasafiri has done, but it's really just been the, the trajectory of what happened with the many of these people who weren't recognized by the mainstream media, especially Bernadine, actually, when she won the Booker. I had so many people ring me up saying, who is Bernadine Evaristo? They've never heard of Bernadine Evaristo. All the newspapers were ringing up saying that. Um, when I first launched the magazine in 1984, it felt like an act of hope, though the world was certainly in a different place. Persistent inequalities and injustices still starkly evident today across race and class divides persisted. Nonetheless, in the first years of publication, despite Wasafiri being a kitchen sink operation without funding, there, what, there were what felt like signs of change. The fall of the Berlin Wall had opened the borders of Europe and signaled the end of the Cold War and the partition of East and West Germany. Apartheid, officially ended at that point in South Africa, we thought, 
the Good Friday Agreement paved the path to peace in Northern Ireland, a major digital revolution. I remember an early piece I wrote entitled There's No Such Thing as Only Literature being drafted on my first computer, an Amstrad, which you've probably never heard of, <laughs> which had offered what then seemed to be the democratic space of the World Wide Web and not the ominous agent it can be today. Things were certainly not all positive. Thatcherism had resulted in the perpetuation of institutionalized racism, social inequalities and economic unrest. A series of uprisings in Brixton, Toxtech and Liverpool were sparked by racially driven murders and attacks. Despite this, and perhaps it was just blind faith, a suspension of belief or simply the irrational naivety of youth, it felt that there might be a glimmer of hope, a possibility for change. Slow but positive shifts began to emerge in UK government reports, in education and the arts, suggesting a growing understanding and commitment to diversity. Some of that optimism was clearly misjudged. By the time Brave New Words was commissioned three and a half decades later, the Danny Boyle's much lauded and celebrated revision of Britain's long history of diversity at the opening ceremony of the 2012 Olympics had long faded from memory. I don't know if you remember watching that, but it was a kind of big explosion and it's certainly all around diversity. Populist movements in the far right were growing worldwide, giving rise to increasing polarization, division and prejudice. The nation was now in the throes of Brexit, alongside a disturbing new raft of even tighter immigration laws and a government condoned culture of hostility towards asylum seekers and immigrants, which came to a head with the Windrush scandal still ongoing. Britain appeared an insular and ever smaller island, at risk of listening once more to the barrage of exclusionary and often outright racist discourses that had first prompted Wasapiri's invention. Given this precarious context, it's perhaps no surprise that dystopian classics such as Huxley's Brave New World, 1932, or George Orwell's 1984, um, published in 1948, began to feature on bestseller reading lists. Written in the shadow of the First World War, Huxley's book appeared in the aftermath of an economic crisis and flu epidemic that had killed millions. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, it imagines a world of drug-induced pleasure, a persistent pursuit of happiness, achieved alongside a numbing and all-consuming conformity and consumption. It is a world where if the individual feels, the society reels. And if you do feel, or worse still, want to think, read or write, you are exiled. Orwell's 1984, in contrast, depicts a bleak totalitarian world controlled by the thought police, you must reject the evidence of your eyes and ears, whose modes of surveillance and doublespeak parallel the darker sides of our own today. Whilst it's become commonplace to point out that fiction can sit eerily and worryingly close to present day realities, whether of fake news, surveillance or the writing and circulation of reinvented national histories, there are several provocative parallels and I'm sure you can think of lots of them right now what's going on in the world, in attempting to cross between the cultural imaginaries of several worlds, Brave New Words sought to give prominence to the politics of the present, whilst envisaging the possibilities for hope in its revisioning of the past. By offering a range of different voices and perspectives, the book explores the multiple valences of hope in different forms and cultural contexts. Though commissioned before the pandemic, the unique contributions of individual writers and the subjects they chose to address are ever more urgent. What is the role of the writer, many ask, in the context of the digital age? In what ways have global migrations impacted on the psyche of nations, on thinking, on language and culture? Will the role of publishers become obsolete, given the powers of the internet as a place of publication? What challenges do today's writers face in attempting to maintain their privacy pursue their craft and avoid being instrumentalized as spokespeople in the increasingly diverse, diverse and divisive, divisive battles of today's so-called cultural wars. Sorry. How sacred is the book and how important will it be for our future archives of memory as the pings of phones and social media become preferred modes of remembering stories conveyed through images or short sound bites 
almost all of the writers in the book engage in different ways with questions of the relationship between writing and politics, as well as the increasingly complex ethics of writing the other. Many will now be familiar with the names of the distinguished writers who are in dialogue in the book. Fewer may have encountered their names in Wasafiri, where many such conversations were staged. These include Bernadine Evaristo, whom I've already mentioned, who following her 2019 Booker win for Girl, Woman, Other, swiftly became a regular media personality. Her essay, What a Time to Be a Black British Woman, W-O-M-X-N, M, writer, had appeared only days before the announcement and was immediately serialized in the Guardian's Saturday Review. Then there's Blake Morrison, who described his personal voyage out as he migrated from rural Yorkshire to London. Also exploring migration and its impact on her personal and writing life is Ava Hoffman, who recounts the psychological trauma of her Jewish family's enforced departure from Poland during the Cold War, as she began life in one language, one country, and learnt to live in another and in another language. In The Dinner That Changed My Life, Palestinian Raja Shahada demonstrates how the creative imagination can lead us to places where activism cannot go, as he recounts how he became conscious, once a writer, of the limitations of legal discourse he'd once used to improve relations between Palestine, Palestine's PLO and Israel, he was a lawyer, and rehabilitate, through words, the tarnished image of his people. Gita Hariaran, Indian writer, focuses on the power of literature and the female body as she illustrates how the ancient myth of Draupadi lives on, despite censorship, in contemporary Indian culture. Directly addressing the theme of the volume, Romesh Gunasekra orchestrates a disturbing disembodied conversation with Aldous Huxley, a dialogue conducted as a digital, digital seance, which crosses over between life and death in more ways than one. What Gunasekra is highlighting is not only the consequences of living in a world controlled by different forms of consumerism, but the very real dangers of the death of the author and of human expression and of language, an idea also explored by Tavish Kerr, who gravely, who came, I think, to York quite recently, didn't he? Mm -hmm. um, who gravely fears the disappearance of the treasures of world libraries and the book. The voice of the author receives a more positive spin in poet Shivani Ramlochan's The Good Brown Girl, which passionately describes how her compulsive need to write was a means of stripping off the burdens of tradition she had inherited. Building alternative vistas, Marina Warner urges us to also see the potentialities of the web, or loom as she renames it, as both core space of experimentation and new literary home for the many writers in asylum who are still displaced. Whilst Evaristo applauds the ingenuity of a new generation of millennial black women who strategically use the internet to sidestep the barriers of traditional literary gatekeepers in bringing their work to attention. As restrictions on democratic freedom continue to be of urgent concern, Bina Shah's personal account of the 2015 murder of Sabine Mahmood, the Karachi activist, for her opening of a cultural cafe, reminds us that writers working in such contexts cannot remain silent, even though their words might endanger lives. So writing the imagination and hope are close relations. As intolerance of otherness continues to escalate, it's often writers who continue, to, who continue to speak up despite censorship, detention, and sometimes death. The writers may not always be able to directly impact on politics or affect change in their worlds. Their brave words certainly contain the passion, hope, and courage to do so. As Toni Morrison, Lo Nobel laureate, was once to observe, the vitality of language lives in its ability to limb the actual imagined and possible lives of its speakers, readers, writers. It arcs towards this place where meaning may lie. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Sushila. So I want to start with a question uh, which I asked you yesterday, but um, let's talk about it again. You began both last night's 30s, well, not, you didn't begin, but 
early in last night's Bertie lecture and early in the introduction to this book, you talk about your encounters, different encounters with a family library, books by Tagore, Gandhi, Vivekananda, Ruth Praj of Bala and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we talked about how other post-colonial writers have also been interested in this, the private library, the family collection of books. So for example, I said um, Amitav Ghosh's my grandfather's bookshelf in use of that Homi Baba has done someone as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Do you know where? I think it, um, I th it, I, it's, it's something like a book called Voices of the Crossing. And I can't remember it. It's um, it'll come back to me. Ferdinand Dennis, um, Yasmin Khan, I think um, it's quite an old book from the 80s. I've got mm -hmm. it on my bookshelf. Fabulous. <laughs> so I just think it's really interesting that uh, that um, that migrant writers have, have been interested in the in the family bookshelf and a kind of discovery of titles and different authors from around the globe. And I also think of um, Tayyab Saleh's season of migration mm -hmm. to the north, where there's a similar, obviously, Mustafa Said's library is discovered by the narrator. And so I just wanted to ask you, what it, what is it that makes the trope long lasting and, and looked at in different ways by different authors, including yourself? And how, if at all, does this bookshelf function as a figuration of hope? I think one of the things, well, I suppose start on the personal. I mean, for me, um, I didn't really come, I mean, I, I was born in Britain, then I went to India and I came back to Britain via a detour in Europe when I was about 11. And I went to a grammar school in a Suffolk town. And, and you know, as Kaz Phillips and many others have said, I didn't encounter any books by African Caribbean, South Asian writers, the most I came to, in, I mean, the, the furthest I got towards India was Passage to India in, 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 in um, Ian Forster's book. Um, and I didn't encounter anything till I got to the University of Kent. Um, and so talking about the bookshelves, it was kind of a long, long detour. So I started reading Caribbean literature, actually, that's what I did my initial research in, and worked particularly on Jean Rhys and Sam Selvon and V.S. Naipaul. Um, and then I moved into Wasafiri and so on and so forth. Eventually I got back to India and South Asia, um, which was a very long detour because my father was Indian. Um, and then I saw these books on my mother's shelf, which I talked about last night. Um, and I remembered seeing them as a child. I suppose the point about them in terms of hope is that, well, first of all, there's obviously the diversity at a, at a very simple level. But I think in terms of these other writers' bookshelves that you're talking about, and in terms of my kind of general work that I've been doing for 40 years, is, is that kind of conversation that's going on between those different texts. It's not just that there were South Asian or African or Caribbean bookshelves. It's the point you know, that there were so many other books. And there's a wonderful picture of Sam Selvon sitting in the National Gallery um, when um, the Lonely Londoners came out and I saw it by chance. I wrote about it actually in one superior because he was, this photograph was in, a, in an exhibition by a photographer called Ida Carr. And there were all these black and white photographs. I mean, he was sitting alongside all these modernists like you know, Jean-Paul Sartre and so on. And I thought, what's Sam doing here? You know, um, because he was, he was sort of kind of out of place. Um, but the interesting thing about that picture was there was a whole load of books behind him. And they were complete wide range of books, German authors, uh, detective stories, films that were popular at the time, the odd Caribbean writer. Um, and I think that's the point really, that what you expect, and I think Tabish would really agree with this and he talks about it a bit. You know, you, what you might expect writers to read or what might have made them is not necessarily the case. And I think Blake Morrison in Brave New Words talks about my bookshelves being my book selves, which is quite a nice phrase, actually. Very nice. And I think also of Nadim Aslam talking about, yeah. he said something about, um, you know, about nationality being irre irrelevant. I'm paraphrasing massively, but he talked about his desk and it, my desk is my passport and, and that kind of thing. And that brings me on to the next um, question that I have, which is from your quote from the essay you've just read, 
you said writing as a form of cultural traveling, a passport to enter imaginative landscapes unseen and a conduit to the diverse histories of many worlds, which I love. I mean, it's really beautifully written and it takes on new resonances in this time of pandemic. Cause you talked about how, you know, you were kind of putting this to print um, months before the global pandemic hit. Well, we actually went to, I launched it in, um, we, well, we launched it at Master Fury's birthday but we actually launched it in Kerala and there were the first four or five wonderful, actually wonderful literary conference in Kerala. It was absolutely fantastic given what the rest of India is like at the moment. Um, so it seemed every, you know, there were about literally 20,000 people over that period of three or four days, but it was just before the pandemic because there were just, people were just at the airport beginning to put on masks mm. and we were thinking, oh my goodness, you know, something's happening. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's exactly it, because our passport suddenly became much less useful for two years, exactly. at least, and our physical entry, entry to other worlds has been blocked. So could you talk a little bit more about this idea of writing as cultural travelling? Because it does seem to me, it's definitely something that has stopped me from, from feeling too depressed at this time, because I was the same, I was in at the Kar Karachi Literature Festival where people started wearing masks and the day it was March the 2nd 2020 the day I was flying home British Airways at, um, flights from Pakistan stopped but luckily I was with PIA so I did get home and then I haven't been anywhere for ever since and so what have re reading and writing meant during COVID-19 especially as you mentioned that Huxley and Orwell were in part responding to a, a flu pandemic a flu pandemic themselves so it's yeah. kind of an interesting yeah um well let me just talk about cultural traveling first mm, and then i'll mm. go on to Huxley. um but obviously cultural traveling was at the core of what started wasafiri and as i said it's a non it's a swahili world word so that immediately suggests the idea of translation so it's not only translation in terms of a literal sense in terms of the language but it's also the idea of metaphorical translation and i don't mean that in terms of cultural traveling so it's kind of like some sort of easy McDonald's cafe or the, let's just go and travel to another land and, you know, like a tourist. It's more a question of kind of almost like a, an abrasive passage that sometimes is abrasive when you travel from one thing. It, it's uncomfortable. You have to see things differently. It makes you enter into the world of others and also realize that you yourself don't know yourself that well. So I think that that point about literature taking you into other places is really, really important. And it can transport you. And I think, you know, going to the pandemic, I mean, there's been a lot of work done, I think, on you know, the effects on mental health during the pandemic, but also the huge increase in reading, actually. Um, because I think we were surrounded by words the whole time on Zoom and on the television and, you know, listening to what we could do or what we couldn't do and the sound bites of social media. But in fact, at a certain point, time was sort of standing still and people were beginning to go into writing and thinking and, and, and in a different way because we did sort of stop. Um, so I think literature became more and more important. And I think poetry especially became important as it did after the First World War when people were seeking spiritual solace. Um, so, so I think that element of traveling, you know, if you're trapped in a house, I mean, everybody was buying telescopes, weren't they, to look at the stars. So, you know, it's a similar kind of imaginative leap in a way to take you somewhere else. And I don't mean that just lightly, I think it did. And I think we needed to travel somewhere else. Um, but in terms of, of cultural traveling, I think more broadly, um, it was just, as I said, it was probably a naive hope I had when I started Wasafiri, this idea that because of what I'd gone through as a child, and because I think Carol Phillips has this quite famous, and I think I'm not sure if I do, but I think I do quote it in the introduction there, about feeling when he was at school that he was starving because he didn't have any, the food of that literature. Um, I kind of experienced that in a similar way because I had nothing to identify with that reflected what I was interested in at the time. Great. Um, the Orwell Huxley uh, dichotomy oh, yeah. um, is very okay. neat. Um, we've got the, the I wanted to, to ask you yeah. about the flu, yeah. flu epidemic, but also 
you know, what, what you do in the piece is show that the author of 1984 is deeply pessimistic, but Huxley shows that distraction and a saccharine vision of happiness can be equally as damaging as totalitarianism. So could you talk a little bit about the, the, the flu pandemic's impact on dystopian fiction, but also why you chose these two authors to, to talk about in this piece about hope? Um, well, the obvious reason is that the book's called Brave New Words, so, and it's playing on, mm -hmm. obviously, Huxley's title. Um, but I think when Huxley was writing in the 30s, there was a kind of move towards new technologies. There was kind of interest in new technologies. Um, so he was exploring that kind of world. It was a playful thing, I think, initially. And he was writing it after the flu pandemic, after the Wall Street crash, a kind of fairly bleak kind of moment. But so many utopias, as we know, actually turn pretty dark, you know, whether, you know, through Hitler, Hitler's sort of world was a utopian or, or communist Russia, or, you know, we've got examples now that, okay. that I can get <laughs> that are quite scary. Um, and there've been a lot of, obviously there's a lot of antecedents to the kind of utopia that um, Huxley was building in terms of Thomas More and Gulliver's Travels and so on. Um, and I'm sure you all know, but he taught Orwell. Um, he, he taught Orwell at one point. So actually when he, Orwell's book came out, he wrote to Orwell and said, uh, well, I, don't, I think it's a bit bleak, your book. <laughs> But actually, I mean, if we if we now, if you now said which one is more relevant now, I mean, it's something that might be worth asking everybody who's read those two books. I should think most of you have read them. Um, which one would be more relevant now? You know, there's this kind of consumerist social, almost social media soundbite kind of world of Huxley's where we're not feeling anymore. And he has this character called John the Savage and sends him off to, to a, a reservation where he's allowed to, I don't think he's allowed to read, but he's allowed to think, you know, but he's dangerous. So that's what happens to people who, who use too many words, they sent away. And that's frightening. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're seeing it in the ways in which history is being rewritten by quite a lot of politicians at the moment. Um, and, and also with Orwell, with the kind of double speak and fake news and all of that. So... Mm -hmm. So since you mentioned social media, um, the internet is mentioned as a digital revolution offering democratic space, but you also talk about it as the ominous agent it can be today. And in her essay, Bernadine Evaristo, in the volume, uh, talks a lot about the how the internet and what she calls its wayward child social media are altering the landscape both of literary culture and race relations. Could you expand on your own thoughts about the internet as either ominous space or a, a space for change in the future you know oh, that's a big question how's it changed <laughs> i know but obviously you can you remember your amstrad and how yeah things now. um well i'm not a very digital person so i'm not sure i'm the right person to ask but um i do remember my amstrad and i i remember how actually how slow it was learning that new language when one first started using computers in a way, because it was all kind of F2, F6, da, 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 not like it is now. Um, but um, I think initially when the internet started, it did feel like a, a, a place where you could express views, um, you could open debates. Um, one didn't have that sense of the big brother, somebody's watching you, the ominous side of it. Um, I think both Bernadine and Marina Warner, Bernadine Everisto and Marina Warner write about the internet um, at length in their essays. And I think it's because it is a pressing topic. And what Bernadine's really saying is that whilst it's wonderful, all this new generation of young black women writers are getting published or getting promoting themselves quite quickly to get published and getting bypassing the kind of gatekeepers of the main publishing houses. On the other hand, she regrets that something's getting lost in that process. And that kind of activism that drove her work isn't really there because it's kind of happened so quickly 
Um, so that's something I guess we can talk about. And the other thing I guess with Marina is Marina saying, yes, it can be this, this threatening space where we have, we get trolled or we get into trouble. On the other hand, she's been working on a huge big project with refugees in Italy. And she said it was the one thing that enabled the writers in those groups to actually communicate with each other because they didn't have computers. They only had their phones and they only had, and they were speaking their poetry to, you know, groups on the internet, like, like through Zoom, I guess. Um, so she saw it as a kind of new space for enunciation. And she talks particularly about the work of Walson Shire, who's, who doesn't fall into that group, but as a poet and how she'd grown her audience through the internet. Um, and also about it being an experimental space chorically in terms of performance poetry. Mm -hmm. So that's quite interesting too. So I think it's it's a mixture of both really. Mm -hmm. That's great. I mean, I've got plenty of other questions, but it's meant to be a workshop. So if people have questions, I if there's a lull, I can throw others in. Try and shout with your questions so that the owl might be able to pick you up, but I think I may have to also translate with experience. <laughs> so I can just repeat your question not to Sashila who will hear, but to the home audience. So yes, what would people like to ask? And that also includes um, Zoom people if you want to put things, is there, is there anything yeah, in the chat? Should we go for the <coughs> chat, chat question? Sure. Give it a bit of a shout to yes. your little part. Yeah, so the question is from Bariana Alexandrova. And she says, your talk has given me genuine hope in the power and necessity of literature especially border crossing literature to effect real change, to create a sanctuary for those on the move in perpetual displacement and those systematically marginalized. Yet I keep wondering about the place of despair too in our reflections on hope. Lola Olofemi's um, recent experiments in imagining otherwise starts with this book was written during a global pandemic. I wish to mark it here by saying so many people that I needlessly I don't believe writing has the power to do anything bad enough to help us. I would just like a space to be set, to set down my despair. I wonder if you could have any thoughts on any aspect of this. Can you just? Yes. Um, it's, um, she said that, in, to paraphrase quickly, mm -hmm. you know, love the talk, found it uplifting, but also wants to talk about despair, especially in the light of the pandemic and mm -hmm. what space there really is for hope. And I think you yourself were quite reluctant in a way to talk about hope. This is unfortunately the remit. And I said, if you want to talk about hopelessness, that's also fine. <laughs> but it's within the remit. Yeah. I guess, I mean, I totally agree, actually. I mean, I think, you know, literature cannot deal with writing and, and the literary can't necessarily deal with that kind of despair. It can't affect political change. It can't mend your body if you're dying it can't get rid of well it can help with grief i think but you know there's certain basic things that for us as human beings it, it can't do i think but where there is hope is i think in in terms of using language in terms of thinking in terms of trying to think yourself or imagine yourself out of a situation that is important and it does take you out of despair and i think that's what a lot of you know so many writers who've been imprisoned um you know, think of Ngugi wa Thiongo, you know, and his diaries, or, you know, even Mandela when he was imprisoned. How did they survive all those years, you know, by writing? Mm -hmm. So I think there is hope through language. And I think, yes, when I was doing this, I thought, God, why did I start Wasafiri all those years ago? Now we're just back in the same old story. You know, we're, we're still trying to decolonize the curriculum. We're still trying to get people to think differently. Mm -hmm. Should one just give up? Mm. But I think the point is one shouldn't give up. One should just carry on trying to make interventions or trying to change the way people think. And the only way you can change the way people think is by changing their language, as Walcott once said, I think. Yeah, great. Yes. Hi, I'm really interested in, in your idea of um, the bookshelf reflecting identity. Uh, when you were saying uh, um, um, about the, the photographs of the, the books that you weren't necessarily thinking uh, would have been on, on the bookshelf behind it. Do you think, in your own case, that if you had had access to your father's literature um, at a sort of a formative age, 
that that would have changed your character. Um, that would have had a, a, um, a sort of a decisive um, uh, uh, the word now, but uh, a sort of effect on mm -hmm. on how you developed as a child. Um, and going on from that, what you just said then again about changing the curriculum within uh, the schools now by by expanding that kind of access. Do you think that, that would have a, a more cohesive effect on uh, on British culture? So quickly, um, it's a question about the bookshelf uh, that we talked about and the pictures of all these books. And if if Sheila had had access to her father's books that are a formative age would that have changed her character and her work and also a broader question about change to the curriculum i think i think that's something that, yeah i think it's a, i mean on a personal level it's a kind of two-pronged thing isn't it i think the fact that i didn't have access to it and i grew up i suppose in in terms of my formative educational years in terms of my secondary and university education primarily in britain it was the fact that I hadn't had access and I felt that there was something missing, missing that galvanized me to spend my whole life doing this, if you like, so, so that in a way. But on the other hand, in terms of education now, and had I be, had access to those things, I think I would, it, it's a question, I think, in the end of what value is attached to the literature. So it wasn't a question of just access, it's how it's taught, how you, how you, how you perceive those books. If I just thought they were, oh, there's the Mahabharata, I should read it. I don't think I'd have probably read it anyway as a, as a British teenager, you know, growing up, you know, during the Enoch Powell period. Um, you know, that was already complicated enough. But now, um, in terms of teaching now and what's going on in universities and schools, um, I've just been advising um, on the OCR, you know, exam board on the A-level A and GCSE texts, and we've been pushing and, and have succeeded now in getting a book by Sam Selborne called The Lonely Londoners onto the A-level syllabus and Bernardine Evaristo's novel on and, 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 you know, poetry by Grace Nichols or John Agard onto the GCSE syllabus. But from my experience of teaching, what really matters is how you, how you convey the value of those points of view to the students or the pupils you're teaching. Um, and it doesn't matter. I mean, if you if you teach something that say, I mean, I, I remember teaching a book like To Kill a Mockingbird, for example, which isn't you know, the greatest book, but you can turn it all around to really get debates going around, proper debates going around race. And so it's a question of being educated in the first place to teach those things in that way. And that also applies to the, publishing houses unfortunately and all the editors who sit in the pub in the mainstream publishing houses because they don't um well they're changing now but they still don't really know i mean there's been a huge surge of late to publish black women writers as bernadine says or black writers current black writers who are the last 10 or 15 years but you know you sit and talk to someone and, and when abdul raza gurna won the nobel prize recently people didn't know his work, you know. Um, he'd been writing for years and years and years. Um, and so there's this kind of, a, I, I don't know if you know what I'm saying, but there's a kind of trend in one direction, which then is missing. And this is what I mean about value, proper value being attached, is really understanding a whole tradition and trajectory of different voices. And that's the bookshelves, because that's where you have different writers speaking to each other and you know if you ask Abdul Razak what he read or what he reads he reads a whole lot mm. you know as does you know as do most great writers actually mm. you know other questions yes Melissa um thank you so much for, for last night's um, fantastic talk and for the, um, the workshop today um I my question follows on from that bit actually it's quite a broad one um and just to sort of frame my personal interest in this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm um, married to someone who works in the publishing industry, um, who actually also was um, helped to establish a um, something called the, the Future Bookshelf, actually coming back to this, the um, Steam mm -hmm. Bookshelf, um, which was aimed at, at addressing this issue of gatekeeping. Uh -huh. um, and just in general, um, 
in relation to your work and your um, experience um, with publishers as a writer, um, I'm just kind of interested to know um, what your um, what you think that the role gatekeepers play could do, um, both in sort of so as commissioning editors, as um, you know, marketing and publicity within publishers and agencies, obviously as well, um, in order to sort of um, you know do what the the lip service is promising, but in a bit more meaningful way. So this is a question about publishing and the issue of gatekeepers and uh, what role they can play. Um, so it goes back to it, as you're saying, it's linked to the previous question. I mean, it goes back to education, I think, in the end, because, you know, there are several young and um, young editors now in, and I'm talking about mainstream publishing houses rather than smaller publishers that are beginning to and have read all those books that I've been trying to talk about and read them alongside other things. So they're not just seeing them as black writing or optionalized in any way that or Asian writing or whatever it is, but they're seeing them, you know, kind of in a in a long continuum of literature. Um, but if they haven't read them, then they they try and do a crash course or they just dip, you know. And that, you know, I can still remember, and it's not actually that long ago, it was probably actually probably is about 15 years ago, going to a, a launch um, or doing a workshop for somebody. And there was an editor from Faber, a white editor from Faber, who had not heard of Derek Walcott. You know, I think I was quoted, and she said, who's Derek Walcott? And I thought, oh, you know, and this was a commissioning editor. <laughs> yes. um, and so that's really quite shocking. And, and, and genuinely, when Bernadine won the Booker Prize, and she'd been published in Wasafiri and elsewhere, she published many novels and been well reviewed, but so many people, and The Guardian did this reprint of her essay. They, it went up online, I think, for about two minutes, saying she was a very uh, little known writer or something. And, and then it went off, you know, but they just didn't know who she was. Um, and actually, that's what I mean. So they're not really following this kind of breadth. And so that's. I guess to go back to Wasafiri, what Wasafiri has been trying to do is actually not be a, I suppose, so-called ethnic minority magazine, which it has never been, um, but to, act, to actually be, to sit alongside, you know, as part of the, part of the main literary kind of and broad um, house of literature, I guess. So, yeah, but I think in terms of changes, I think, I think there's a lot of there's a whole class thing going on as well to do with you know when you meet editors from the top publishing houses and agents they're all they're often quite a similar kind of type mm -hmm. um and you know that's not to say i'm not trying to say that they haven't read these things but my feeling is that they haven't a lot of the time sorry yeah. Hi, thank you. That was a great talk. Um, so I was just reading this book called Redlining Culture, and it's about mm -hmm. diversity in the publishing industry post 1945. And the main argument was essentially that we assume that publishing has gotten more diverse, especially in the 80s and 90s. Um, and since, but that isn't really the case, and you see kind of a blip in diversity, quote unquote, um, in publishing around like the time that Toni Morrison was editor. But after that, it kind of declines again. And even in the contemporary scene, it's not as um, literature and, that, and publishing isn't as diverse as people seem to think it is. Um, so in your experience, what do you think could be done to make it more diverse? Is there anything to be done? Or do you think it's kind of a roadblock right now? Well, I think it's beginning to happen, actually. I think it is finally beginning to happen. I think that it's got to happen on a number of levels. It's got to happen at an institutional level, in the pub 